against us. And uh, I ran for the United States Senate from the county council because it was too hard being a councilman. They know where you live. <laughs> Well, good morning, Boone. It's great to be back on Iowa. I said uh, when I launched my campaign, and I mean it sincerely, that, uh, that I'm, you're going to have seen a lot of me, a lot of me. And uh, I'm here to try to earn your respect and support. This is a marathon. It's a long way off. I don't look at any of the polls. I know one thing. The only poll that matters is what happens on caucus day. And, uh, you know, uh, you all know and excuse me for having my glasses on, my sunglasses, but the sun is shining directly here. The, uh, you all know that, uh, that this election is different than any you've ever participated in. Not because Joe Biden or anybody else was running, because the man who occupies the White House. No matter how young or old you are, there's not a more important election you participated in. And we all know, we all know uh, who this president is. And we all know, except him, I suspect, that the words presidents speak matters. They can move markets. They can, they can send brave women and men to war. They can bring peace. They can be a voice of calm in moments of national turmoil. They can console and they can comfort in moments of tragedy. They can inspire us to literally go to the moon. Or they and they can appeal to our better angels in times of difficulty. Or, or they can unleash the deepest, darkest forces in this nation. And that's what Donald Trump, in my view, has chosen to do. When he said after Charlottesville, as people come watching up, walking out of fields, carrying torches, contorted faces, their veins bulging, literally, hundreds of them shouting and chanting anti-Semitic bile, carry Nazi flags accompanied by, accompanied by the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacists. And a young woman was killed. And they asked him, what did he think? And he said, quote, there's some very fine people on both sides. Very fine people. No president has ever said something like that. He gave license and safe harbor to hate, to white supremacists and the KKK. Those words, those words stunned the nation and shocked the world. And I'm not, that's not hyperbole. They stunned the nation and shocked our friends around the world. In doing so, he assigned a moral equivalence between those spewing hate and those with courage to take it on. I said at the time, and this is all, we're, we're approaching the two-year anniversary of this, uh, of Charlottesville. I said at the time, and it wasn't hyperbole, we're in the battle for the soul of this nation. When I announced in Philadelphia my campaign for president, I said it again. And I say today, we are, we are today in the battle for the soul of this nation, and that's the primary reason why I'm running for president of the United States. Yeah. Unfortunately, Charlottesville is no isolated incident. Trump announced he was running for president as he came down the escalator in his gold palace. As he came down, he said he talked about calling Mexicans rapist. Days before the midterms, this last time around, he fomented fear. He, that he talked about a caravan heading to the United States. He said, look at what's marching up. It's an invasion, an invasion. He asserted that immigrants would quote, I'm quoting him, carve you up with a knife, end of quote. How far, how far are the things he said in the language he used saying this is an invasion? How far is that from the shooter in El Paso declaring this attack is a response to a Hispanic invasion of Texas. I don't think it's very far at all. The president's words matter. In both clear language and code, this president has fanned the flames of white supremacy in this nation. And the energetic embrace of this president by the darkest hearts, the most hate-filled minds in this country say it all. David Duke, the former head of the KKK, when those folks came out of the field and the confrontation occurred, he said, 
This is why we voted, I'm quoting, this is why we voted for Donald Trump, because he said he was going to take our country back. White nationalist Richard Spencer hailed Trump, saying, quote, this is the kind of white nationalism we elected him for. Did you hear a single syllable of condemnation from him of either of those men? He embraced what they said. Our children are listening. We don't talk about it enough. Our children are listening. You know, the president, whether we like it or not, is the face of America. It's a role model. And he's having a gigantic impact on future generations. We can overcome four years of Donald Trump. I believe the four years of Trump, if we beat him, will go down as an aberration in American history. It will take a lot of work to put things back in shape, but we can do it. But folks, if we give him eight years, I really believe this from the bottom of my heart. He will forever change the character and nature of who we are. That's why we have to defeat Donald Trump in 2020, period. Period, period, period. And folks, that's why I'm running. The second reason I'm running is because I think it's time we have to restore the backbone of this country. The backbone of the country is the middle class. America. You all built America. My parents built America. Ordinary, hard-working people given half a chance. This is, not, this is not a joke. It's literal. Given half a chance for the people that build America. They've never, ever, 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 ever let their country down when there's been something remotely approaching a fair shot. My dad used to have an expression. He said, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in your community. It's about how you fit. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. When my dad lost his job and everything, we had to move from Scranton when Cole died. He was not a coal miner. He was in sales. He was a white collar worker. But he moved back to where he had gone to school from second grade to junior in high school. Claymont, Delaware, in Delaware, because there were some jobs back then. Every time there was a recession, somebody in our family or one of our neighbors lost a job. And he'd always say, Joey, a job's more than a paycheck. And folks, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's about being able to uh, actually look your kid in the eye and say, it's going to be okay, honey, and mean it. My dad made a walk that a lot of folk in Iowa, f f folks in Iowa had to make. I call it the longest walk, up a short flight of stairs to tell your kid, I can't live here anymore, honey. Lost my job. Mommy lost her job. Daddy lost her job. You're going to move on with Grandma and Grandpa, or Gram in my case, Grandpa. But I'll be back. It'll work. I'll be back. I'll be back in a year. I'll come home every weekend. It's only 157 miles. I remember that walk up the stairs. I remember thinking, 157 miles, that's like going to the moon. That's so far away. But he came home. But talk about dignity. How hard it must have been for my dad and people you know to walk up to his father-in-law, who was a father of four sons and a daughter, and say, Ambrose, can you keep Gene and the kids? I'll be back. It strips a woman or a man of their pride to have to do that. But so many people have done it. But today, today, so many middle-class people don't think they can make it anymore. My dad believed that it would be okay. He believed that we'd be able to be, and he, and he made it happen. He made it happen. But the deal is, today over half the American people think their children will never have the standard of living they have. Look at Iowa. Back in the days when I was a kid, we took the Iowa test. You had the single best education program in America. Look at today. I love my Republican friends in Congress, the president, who said, let me tell you what I, I value education. My dad had an expression. Somebody said, let me tell you what I value. He said, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget. I will tell you what you value. Seriously. Well, look what's happening here, folks. The fact of the matter is...
But the poor are getting poorer and the bottom's falling out. My North Star as president will be rebuilding the middle class. And this time, everyone comes along. Everybody comes along. Regardless of your background, your color, your religion, your race, everybody gets brought along. Folks, we need to understand that the middle class isn't a number. The middle class is a value set. It's about being able to give your child a good education. It's about being able to be in a position where there's economic opportunity for you and for them. It's about being in a position where you have access to affordable health care. That's why we need to finish the job we started on health care in our administration. We passed... I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you're all sitting in the sun, but I'm going to just take about another three to four minutes. We passed the Affordable Care Act. When we did that, I told the president I thought it was a big deal or something to that effect. <laughs> Thank God my mom wasn't around. But look, the Affordable Care Act was a huge step forward for America. It, we made historic progress. It extended health care for more than 20 million Americans who didn't have it before. But maybe most importantly, it provided for the first time coverage for pre-existing conditions that couldn't be afforded for over 100 million Americans. But we have to finish the job now. We have to finish the job now. We have to make health care a right. It should not be a privilege. It's a right. Every American should have the right to adequate health care. And for me, that means restoring all the cuts in Obamacare, adding to it a public option so you could buy into a Medicare-like proposal if that's what you chose to do. And if you don't have the money, you're automatically admitted to that program, automatically. Changing the nature of subsidizing to be able to buy in more so that you can buy a gold plan and not have to buy the silver or copper, to be able to buy the gold plan. We can do all this. We can afford to do all this. It costs a lot of money. It will cost $740 billion over 10 years, but it's not $30 trillion. And if you like the private plan you have, you can keep that plan, assuming your employer continues to supply it for you. But the bottom line is, it's the fastest, most effective, cost-effective way to get to universal coverage by protecting and building on Obamacare while increasing access and reducing, reducing cost. You know, when it comes to education, as my wife Jill would say, who's taught full-time as second lady, will start teaching again in 10 days, uh, again, although she's cut her load back, so she's going to be in the road for, I don't know how she does it, she's going to be in the road four or five days campaigning in the classroom a couple. But uh, we have to make sure every child, every child gets a, gets a great education, regardless regardless of their race. Not just wealthy white children, but all children. Poor, rich, whatever their background, get an education. Look, whether their parents' income, whether their zip code, whether they have a disability, that shouldn't be the determining factor. We have to eliminate the funding gaps that exist between majority white and non-white districts, between majority wealthy and not wealthy districts. We have to eliminate that funding gap. Because my education plan, what I do is I go out, you all, I'm, I'm going to start with, talking like a little bit of a wonk, but all the teachers know this is Title I. The fact of the matter is that we have a circumstance where we can, in fact, go to Title I schools, meaning schools that are in disadvantaged economic areas. And we can, in fact, triple the amount of money we spend there. We spend $15 billion a year. By eliminating just a few of the tax cuts, I'm going to eliminate mostly all of them, but a few of the tax cuts, we can, no, you think I'm joking, I'm not. Uh, you know anything about me and taxes. Uh, but at any rate, you know, so increases to $45 billion a year. You know what that does? It allows every single child in America who is three, four, and five years old to go to pre-kindergarten, not a daycare, pre-kindergarten, that in fact they learn something. The disadvantage they go to school with will be wiped out. Those of your educators or professors know, those of you who have your doctors know, that there is a direct correlation between having that early education and being able to succeed in life. Being able to succeed when you come from very disadvantaged circumstances. It can make it up. There is no child 
who's incapable of learning based on their background, if given an opportunity. And now I know my opponents attacked me for uh, being a little delusional and uh, naive. I find it interesting. I'm the old guy, but I'm naive. I, I that, uh, you know, uh, it brings me to the third reason why I'm running. And that is we have to unite this country. We cannot in this system move along as a divided country. A politics is based on hate and vengeance, attacking one another. That's not what the American people want. No other group of people in the world can engage in this idea 